everyone. I'm Kavan, the co-founder of Indiefolio. And today we have Venki, who's the design manager at One Thing. I wanted to talk a little bit more about the topic today. If you are a designer in India, the next decade is going to be very interesting for you. You'll observe that um, a lot of companies in the whole world are coming to India. The same way they came for IT outsourcing, designs, the next thing. It's already happening, as one thing will tell you. So you'll have to understand how you can build for the world from your homes. And parallelly, you'll also hear a lot about the next billion users. These are folks in tier 2, tier 3 cities within India. They speak a dozen languages, dozens of dialects, and have a very different understanding of how to interact with a digital product. So we have Vinky here from One Thing. One Thing is global UI UX design studio I've been following personally for a long time. They do some brilliant work with big companies like Coca-Cola to some upcoming startups like Jupiter. They also have built for the world from their homes in India and have also done a lot of work at the grassroots level. So thanks a ton, Venki, for taking out the time and coming here. I have a bunch of questions for you. To start off with, Venki, I'd like if you can just reintroduce yourself and talk a little bit more about your background and if you can even share some information about one thing, that'll be brilliant. Awesome. All right. Yeah. I love talking about myself. <laughs> it's one of my <laughs> uh, most favorite things to do. So I am Venki. I am the uh, design manager here at One Thing Design Studio. One Thing has been around for about seven plus years now. We have very humble beginnings. We have team of, I think, five, six people when we started. And right now we are placed at about 85 plus people across India with an office in Gurgaon, with a, our HQ in Gurgaon and another studio in Bangalore as well. Yeah. And as you rightly put it, we've designed for the world, we for even startups that are uh, global. It's been a fun ride with one thing. Me, I personally started my design journey back in 2015 when I, when I started my post-graduation at NYU. I did my master's in a course called Integrated Digital Media which is which is it's interesting it's a course that combines engineering and media and design i the way i like to put it is that this course i had worked a camera as in i made movies etc short films etc but at the oh. same time i also learned how a camera works it's it was that's where i actually discovered its design that was one of the electives i had taken and that elective is now my career and my life as it stands right now and I worked in New York for a bit as well. We, I worked in New York for about two, two to three years before I joined One Thing back in 2018. So I've been with One Thing for about, it'll be five years in uh, April. So yeah, it's been a long, wild journey and it's been a lot of fun. It's not a journey that stopped. Yeah, and looking forward to the next five years of One Thing and seeing what we <laughs> offer to the world. Fantastic. What a nice story. I think very few people have learned creative and design abroad and they've chosen to come to India. So I think I, I'd love to know more about that shortly. But what I wanted to actually start off by asking you, Venki, is we have a lot of people here who will be probably tuning into this video. And the first thing they'll be curious to know is what's the kind of scope out there, right? What kind of companies are coming to India? What kind of products are we supposed to design? And even in intra-India, what kind of problems are we dealing with? So right. if you could quickly maybe highlight a project, you know, you've done for a global audience and maybe a project you've done internally for the India tier two, tier three cities, that'll be, I think, a good starting point. All right. That's a great question. In fact, the international project I really want to talk about is the Super NDA. It's unfortunately ongoing and there are two such projects we are doing for international clients, which are... Uh, which are ongoing. So I can't even tell you like the domain and stuff. It's like that. But the one I would like to highlight is this one interesting project called Modal.ai. They are a game analytics platform and game analytics and testing. So using artificial intelligence, like games go through a bunch of testing rounds, right? Just right. bugging, testing, debugging. So now they use actual testers. Like they use actual people who sit right. at a console, at a desktop and play those games for hours on end. And as uh, fancy as game testing sounds, it's actually not that fun. It's basically you going to one corner and jumping like 300 times to see if it breaks. It's legit like that. It, it tends to get like one of the more, more nitty gritty things about game testing. It tends to get quite boring. 
So they right. use artificial intelligence to do all of those things and figure out where your game is breaking. So the proper statement therein was quite fancy and we had to build uh, build out there, obviously the landing page, the website, etc., and tell that story in a way that it made sense to people buying into it. Right, because obviously it would be so. They they had clients like Riot Games, etc., who are famous for League of Legends and things like that. It's fun. It's fun to tell that story for other investors. It's not like a one-to-one user-based story that you're doing. You're doing it. You're you're telling a story of a company for other companies. And as a service agency ourselves, we can get behind that having to tell that story in a way that it makes sense to other audiences. So that was something that we really enjoyed doing. We also built, uh, we also helped to sort of design Swivel, which is what you call a, a ride sharing app, which is based out of the Middle East. So it's, it was, again, we did a couple of different continents and it's always been fun. You brought up Coca-Cola, which was actually for Coca-Cola Maldives. So it was a, it was a platform that allowed users to get Coke to their homes. And that ties in directly with what we are doing here. So it's, I'd actually like to talk about that because the problem statement therein is, it sounds niche, but it's something that someone decided to solve, right? So Coke to home is an app that allows you to buy Coke products and have it delivered to your house. And in a country like Maldives, where grocery stores, etc., are not as prevalent, or you don't have the luxury of an Instamart or a Blinkit, it becomes difficult. So uh, Coke decided to solve that problem by directly going to consumers. And uh, you might think that it's a, such a, they have, if you're just doing Coke products, that's limited SKUs. How do you keep people engaged? How do you make sure that everyone understands what's going on in the app and things like that? Uh, what you have to remember is that those are the same problems we are trying to solve back home. Like how do you keep people engaged in your app? How do you make sure they keep coming back? These are not problems that we haven't solved. You just have to look at what's been done at home and then try and bring that back to what you can do for this audience. And that's exactly what we did for Coke Maldives. Now, exactly. So now this sounds... If I, if I can interject here, very interesting. I think when I hear something like this initially, I'm like, huh, why? And then I'm like, okay, yeah, everybody doesn't have the Swiggy and Zomato privilege there because... It's a huge operation and may not make a lot of financial sense to for a lot of these players to go there. So just was very curious, right? You're sitting out of India and you're looking at big problem. While I understand that overall objectives like acquisition, retention, engagement, things you work upon, but it all starts with understanding the customer, understanding the market. How do you actually do that when you are sitting here and designing for a customer thousands of kilometers away from you? That's again, another great question, Kaman. What you have to remember is that you don't have the problem of understanding an audience that you did say even 10, 12 years ago. Now, more than ever with the way internet has permeated, like every uh, household, it's very easy to know what people are thinking because they let you know on the internet, right? So what we do is, um, Now, this method already exists, of course, it's ethnographic research where you try and understand a people, right? A group of people through their, through the way they behave, through the way that they react to things and the way that they respond, etc. So we just basically go to the websites frequented by them to begin with. That's our first foray into ethnographic research is how do people respond or react online, say to a news article or say to even a Reddit post for that matter, right? You, every country has its own subreddit. You can go over there and check out what the biggest problems are, what the biggest news items are and things like that. When you go to other news sites and figure out what is the most talked about news article in the last month or so, last year or so, and you use all of that information, you use that in the way that you write your micro copy, you use that in the way that you do your shapes and colors in the, the way that you form informational hierarchy and things like that. So essentially just basically reading people and as designers, your key job is to observe and absorb, right? So you're observing what people are doing and then you absorb the way that they're functioning and you, and that the output you give in your design is a reflection of what you understood by learning what people want and what people are saying. Very interesting. So would it be safe to say it's like a lot of secondary research and quantitative research which you're basically doing 
or do you also indulge into a lot of qualitative research do user interviews maybe travel to mauritius does that is it, is it part of the process uh yes sorry so, you. yeah you are right about quantitative research based on the quantitative research we create some assumptions about what we mm-hmm. think our personas or our obviously see if you're working with client with an international client you have a set of data that they provide to you they have your target audience that this is the age group this is the demographic this is the psychographic this is their hopes and dreams their goals their pain points you get all of that you can also get additional data from them things like what are their top complaints during when someone calls customer support for example right what are their so you are essentially doing the same things you would do here only now you have to understand the people behind that those complaints behind that data right and then once you have that set of assumptions you have that set of quantitative data you do have to still conduct user interviews right now you the follow up question to that would be ki what if they are us based clients how do you do that how do you speak to somebody in the us at a time where it's comfortable for them that's the key it has to be comfortable for them so we in fact in the past so we did a discovery project with a culinary famous culinary school based out of france and we've had discovery calls at 6:30 in the morning with the stakeholders like it starts at 6:30 in the morning and this is back when we weren't doing work from home so i was at the office at 6 in the morning to do this <laughs> so you do have to get into the mindset of all right there are no time zones when it comes to working with international audiences and international clients but anyway coming back so yeah you still have to do your round of user interviews you still have to validate those assumptions that you have made through your quantitative research and that's the only way to go about it you still have to follow the design thinking method got it i think makes a ton of sense i think that's a good framework where i look at a lot of secondary research ethnographic points data points on interests and then you have your client give you some data and then you validate all of that through some qualitative interviews that's a good framework i think for anybody out there building products for any geography they are not familiar with wanting to go now on the flip side and as i asked you Let's talk about the next billion users, which are going to be Indians in tier two, tier three. There as well, right? There is a huge difference in culture and usability. Can you give an example on what you created? That'll be a good starting point. Yeah, this is like hands down one of, my, one of the favorite projects I've done in the last five years or so. It's called Local. It's a local language news and classified app. And for an added fun constraint, we had to build this during the pandemic, so there was no travel involved at all. तो इसके रिसर्च वगैरह घर बैठ के करने पड़े थे मेरे को विच वॉज विच वॉज इफ यू थिंक आई वी लुक बैक एंड नाउ साउंड लाइक फन बट लाइक आई नो दर्क दैट वी हैव टू फॉर दैट बट फॉर लोकल अगेन सो लोकल इज डेवलेंट मोस्टली इन द साउदर्न रीजन ऑफ इंडिया सो दे हैव लॉट ऑफ ऑडियंस बेस्ड आउट ऑफ कर्नाटका बेस्ड आउट ऑफ यू नो तेलंगाना तमिलनाडु थिंग्स लाइक दैट एंड द लोकल आइडियोलॉजी इज वॉज क्वाइट क्लियर they had a very set bunch of principles in their heads when they came in to work with us it's essentially that if there's a grocery store owner out of ananta he would want to know he or she would want to know if the road outside of that grocery store which has been broken for a week and is affecting business when would that get fixed over and above what is happening in the us so when you look at something of that so when you look at tier 2 tier 3 what you have to understand is that their world view is expanding they do know what is going on in the rest of the world and i'll just get into the features that they use etc which blew me away but over and above that they also understand that their day to day is more important we have the luxury of and i think it's our privilege in that that we have the luxury of worrying about russia ukraine us and all of that over and above what we already go through on a day to day basis but tier 2 tier 3 citizens don't they need their day to day to be sorted out to worry about anything else and one of the so what we had to do and the kind of things that we had to do to get the interviews done was also fun because we needed a translator because none of us spoke the, i speak tamil but it is horrible <laughs> the way i speak it because i was brought up here we needed a translator for tamil as well so we tied up with a translation agency and got ourselves a translator for the interviews now the other challenge in that is now when you ask me a question in english and if i understand english i know the context within which you're talking to me but if i were if you were to ask me a question in english someone else was to translate it to me in telugu 
And then I got the answer in Telugu and then I translated back again in English. You have lost all context. You might as well have put the answer through Google Translate and got and then copy pasted whatever you got at the other end. And uh, the reason I brought, bring that up is because our designs needed to be, our final designs needed to be in Telugu to see if the font that we're using is legible. Turns out it wasn't because Telugu is a very rounded font and uh, they're very rounded lettering and we use a very rounded font. So that was wrong. So we had to change all of that. The other thing was that we realized context was very important because certain words, when you translate them, will give you synonymous translations. So a word like following is not just people who are following you. It is also mean, it also means next. And instead of writing Paul, so, you know, if someone made a profile in local, they would have followers following and all of that, the same as Instagram, right? But instead of followers and following, it just said followers and next. And uh, during our UAT, we had to correct that. And uh, we also had to explain to the translator the context within which to ask the question. So there's a lot. In fact, I found it easier to design for Maldives, for Norway, for Dubai than I did for my own tier two, tier three citizens. Even though the practices we used were exactly the same. It's the same ethnographic research. It's the same user interviews. It's the same bunch of quantitative data that you're collecting. The way you have to look at things is first and foremost, if you're de designing for the global audience or the next billion in India is ethnography and context are very important. The way they look at things is very important. The way they use things is very important. Yeah. I can get into the kind of features that they were using. Right. right. Yeah. So I think context is very important. Absolutely. Uh, it often ha happens where we've run some vernacular campaigns for this is more marketing design yeah. where they wanted to localize their ATL, BTL activities. And uh, often that happens, right? For example, what's up, bro is Cooper kya hai bhai. So that's, there's yeah. no context there and it's difficult sometimes. And the problem which we faced was always like, who's approving this because somebody may translate it, but then how do I, as a design manager or as the leader of a project, give a go ahead. And from what I understand, you did that through usability testing. Basically, you mm -hmm. got a bunch of actual users. And they gave you feedback and I'm assuming you picked users who could communicate with you in English. Not really. No. Okay. So how, how did that orchestration work? Thankfully, our client had a good database of users and we had to pick a good spread. And that's important, right? Within even your primary demographic, for example, say your primary demographic is like most apps nowadays is 28 to 45 or 25 to 45 or whatever, you still have to account for a bunch of different things. You have to account for what do you call their language capability. For example, if you're building a local language app, you need someone who communicates in that exclusively first, but you also need an English speaker. You, yes, you need a tier two city user, but at the same time, you might need to map that against a metro city user who still wants to know what is happening back home. So you need to get that spread right. It either, you can't have it be too thin because then you get a bunch of conflicting data, but you can't have it be too narrow. Okay, okay I'll only pick these people. That's also not going to help you. You need to do a bunch of interviews for this to begin with. And context, you're absolutely right. And this stands true for audiences across the world. One of the things I learned while working in New York was that, hey, is considered informal in emails and you don't do that for clients. Clients based on the US don't understand the phrase the same. When we talk about something and then we follow that up with another line, we say, can you give me more clarity regarding the same? That's a no-go zone for US clients. What? This is new yeah. to me too. <laughs> I was like, man, it's, it makes a lot of sense yeah. say, instead of day after tomorrow. We just say the day after the day after what we are day after tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. And it's the same for our audiences, like following in next, we had a lot of things that we got wrong, but we have way more things that we got right. One of the things we got right was we wanted to change one of the key navigation items in the, in the navigation bar at the bottom. And we needed to change it from headlines. So there was a couple of navigation items, but the two more, most important ones were local and headlines. So local had local news and headlines and everything else, but audiences did not understand that. They thought headlines had all the news or local may matlab aise kuch bhi aa hai wo. So we needed to change that. So we changed it to local. We kept local as is, but headlines we changed to newsstand because we want to let them know that this is where all your magazine stuff is, everything else. 
because newsstands in tier two, tier three cities are still quite prevalent. You still have them at bus stops. So they understood that. And obviously usability testing proved that to be right, but it did give that clear demarcation and that was important. I think ethnography and context are two keywords for us. I think if you folks are designing for India or for the world, remember these aspects that should help you out. The next question is about the team, right? If you're a design manager, you have to be the maestro and get the work done, right? With a bunch of people. Now, specifically regarding our topic of building, let's say for India or you're building for the world, you have these cultural contexts or you've got these other nuances involved. When you structure a team, how do you go about it? If you can give some insight, do you look at some person who's local or how do you tackle such a problem? Team structure, you're absolutely right, is very important when it comes to building any product, right? Now, if it's a product that requires a lot of ethnographic research, it's paramount that you have a senior UX researcher on your team, someone who has the time and the skill set to go through the different cultural touch points for the audience that you're building. One of the things that I like doing with my senior UX researchers is that anytime we have an international client come in, we watch movies from that country because it provides a lot of context, right? It tells you what are the, some of the key phrases that are used. Right. Some of the, like you said, what's up, like what's up is such a common phrase for us. Right. But uh, different countries have uh, different ways to do it. Some have formal, informal notations, things like that. So you need to use that for any greeting that you might have on your app or your website or anything of that sort. So senior UX researcher gives you that base. They provide you with a UX researcher, basically someone with a skill set to understand what are the touch points that we have to build based upon. Then of course you have your lead UX designer who sets up all the user flows, the journeys based on your research. So obviously everything stems from research and your research never stops. So it's paramount to have a researcher with you who can take you through that journey. And the lead UX designer basically builds based on all the validated touch points, all the validated data, right? Uh, the lead UX designer does that. Obviously you have your UX outside of that. You have UX designers who build based on the flow the lead UX designer has created. Then you have your lead UI designer who has another job entirely in terms of figuring out culturally and ethnographically, what are the colors that they can use? What are the uh, shapes and figures that they can use? And if there's anything that's a no go zone, all right? For, for example, the US does use a lot of red and yellow in their designs. And that's based on the bigger corporations who've been doing well in the US, like McDonald's and others like that, Burger King or any other food joints that you have. So you do use a lot of red, but like in India and all, we don't really use red because it signifies danger for us. And uh, we leave it for like error messages and stuff. And uh, you might argue that uh, US apps also use red for warnings and error messages. And that's true, but they use it outside of that as well, which you don't see all that often. So yeah, and the UI designer then has to figure out what are those cultural touch points that they have to be wary of while building. And then the UI designer is working with the lead designer, build out the rest of the visual design screens, etc. We also at one thing obviously have a very strong visual design team in terms of graphics, motion design, things like that. That That is like an add-on to your product, of course. So it's a good structure. I think it's a structure I've heard a lot of folks do to drive successful projects. Maybe I can ask you a follow-up question to be inclusive and you have to have the ability to understand global context or context beyond you. When you as a design manager are recruiting, hiring, getting together a team, what are those skill sets you look for? And if I am a designer who wants to work with you, let's say, and I want to work on this, on these kinds of projects, what would you look for in my work? Or when I'm doing an interview, what would you look in me as a skill or an ability? Right. Okay. It's going to sound abstract what I tell you, but it's literally what we look for when we are interviewing people. First and foremost, curiosity. If you're not curious about the world around you, then it doesn't matter what you're building for, who you're building for, you're not going to get there because you need to have a curious mind and a way to satiate that curiosity. You already have a set of things you look at, 
for example for me it's a google scholar i will look at peer reviewed papers for my research not medium articles do each their own of course but my point is that i have an outlet for that curiosity the other is the willingness to learn only if you are open to learning will you be further open to learning about different cultures if you are not even open to learning about basic things then like how can i expect you to foray into a cultural minefield so to speak and uh, learn more about those people so yeah definitely a curiosity a willingness to learn and of course tool and all comes later tool usage anybody can learn how to use a tool right but it's an objective based understanding right asking yourself why anytime you're doing it and if you are able to answer that five six times then and only then can you build it right yeah so asking yourself why these three things are quite important for us in terms of hiring awesome curiosity willingness to learn and why defend your freaking designs <laughs> i hate the designers who can't defend their designs <laughs> yeah, exactly like you've built it and you can't tell me why you've built it then why did you build it so it's yeah, and say so much right if you can't defend your design you don't have that willingness to learn what's the right process exactly, or not exactly. you know the curiosity to really care ki are yahan kyun banaya maine yeah 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 people venn diagram to look at and in general in life like if you're looking at people like if they have these three qualities they're probably good people do <laughs> 100% 100% a lot of times like this video for example will be distributed to a lot of founders or pms or ctos probably mm-hmm. building saas for the world now they are not designers so one question i had for you is like another up two questions for you here do you see a huge difference let's take an example of just america or usa or europe right now do you see a substantial characteristic which is different of a usa user as compared to an indian user if so what are those one two things i'll ask you this question first then i have another question to ask you based on i'll tell you what there are always going to be differences in the way people look at things right us audiences for example uh expect things to work just i know that's a very matlab bahut upar se bolne wali cheez hai ki ha kaam karna chahiye but if you look at indian audiences when things break we are not surprised <laughs> because things break around us all the time <laughs> all right but in the us things work and they work as intended so when things break digitally they their first reaction is that this is a shit product right so you have to ensure that the nitty gritties of your product are sorted out there's in fact a really cool story about when jeff bezos was expanding amazon and he it's in his i think it's in his autobiography i'm not sure but he needed the customer service time to be under one minute if someone has called you they need to be they need there needs to be a response in under a minute and so he had the head of customer service in one meeting and he asked has that threshold been achieved and the dude was like it's been done jeff like ho gaya hai matlab aap abhi phone karke dekh lo and jeff bhaiya ne phone laga diya they called customer service and it rang for a minute and a half right before i think about 2 minutes almost before somebody picked up on the other end and all jeff said was oh nothing just testing and then he just hung up and he blasted that dude like and that's the level of competency that they expect over there so when you're building for a us or a us client for that matter they expect you to have taken care of every little thing right even a spelling mistake is considered a no go like that just means to them that means that you don't care which is true and that is exactly the attitude we have over here our director of design manik before his review i remind myself of the jeff bezos story because if he sees a pixel out of place he will take you to school for it and that's exactly the kind of thinking you need when you're building for a us or a european client in india like i said they expect things to break they expect things to delay they expect buffer time and all of that if it's a four month long six month long project they expect a buffer time of one or two more months or whatever which is so common here that like we tend to forget the fact that asa nahi hota usually but that's just the way it is over here like that's just the kind of thing. 100% I think yeah they are a very mature market like when Absolutely. you said it I was like yeah that's actually very true they are a mature market they are used to using digital since so long plus they're a little spoiled as we all know everything's been working around them across the board for several years yeah uh, for us it's right hey, it happened on time are it's working so good <laughs> right 
where it's it's elating and amazing for us for them it's like standard saying ye to if you are not doing this why are you in the market absolutely however for your follow up i will tell you this though for some of the products that we've come up with here you will hear any nri who comes in here will just be amazed at upi for example so some things that are there that for us are just obvious like 10 minute delivery and upi payments they don't exist back there delivery fee hi nahi hota kahin kahin apps mein over there you they charge you at least 20 30% in just delivery fees right so some things over here are different so you have to keep that in mind so if you expect a us client to have a turnaround time of 10 minutes for their delivery app that's not going to happen if you are building with that in mind then forget about it right but over here it's the norm they want to like 5 minute mein agar koi kar sakta to they would have done it like they would have invented teleportation by now if it would have helped their bottom line dude but here we are but that's going to be there so you have to find out these nitty gritty things and you have to make sure you've done your research not only on the users but more importantly on the stakeholders know what their expectations are don't just go in thinking i'll figure it out you won't i'm telling you this as someone who's worked there and someone who continues to work with clients from there you will not figure it out know what their objectives are and know what they expect before you get into it and that stands true for clients over here as well for that matter 100% we also don't see government taking up such a problem and then making it like a democratic tool or a system working with some leaders or kols of private sectors because generally if you have to solve payments for a lot of people in our country today they have to trust the government for that because that's one entity they trust other than a lot of brands so obviously that that's a controversial topic to delve into but the majority of india as compared to let's say a europe or an america they have more trust with let's say someone at the government level saying ki isme paisa dalo kuch nahi hoga i'm trusting you so we are becoming more mature generally and sure we'll see so much more coming like with ondc also i'm extremely excited to see what that does and if that works out and my supporting question to you yuki was you mentioned across the board be it local be it the coke project you're talking about there was data which was given to you and that was very helpful so often as a marketplace i'm talking to so many brands they're like what do you want what information can i supply you with can you unpack that for the audience for example let's say you know i want to go to one thing or any other design studio out there what level of homework do i need to do in order for me to create a brief which makes sense which helps a design partner understand the problem effectively oh yeah that's an easy one to solve yeah that's and that's an answer that most stakeholders have anyway who are you building for first first and foremost what are you building right what is this platform what are you trying to solve are you trying to solve for delivery are you trying to solve for financial situations what are you trying to solve for with your product so what is the objective what are you building and what is your objective then who are you building it for not just like an age range but like where do they live what do they do for a living how do they commute to work or even if you have that kind of information right what is their day to day even if you just don't have something in that in depth but definitely like something along the lines of like what are the goals that they will try and achieve through this product for example right and when will they use it most importantly if it's a news and classified app i'm you going to be using it like in the mornings most likely right sometime during my lunch hour and then in the evening once i'm back from work right but if i have a food delivery app i'm being used exclusively during lunch time and dinner time right maybe during breakfast as well if you're lazy but overall overall these things need to be sorted out for you as the stakeholder of that product the who the why the what and the when these are important and yeah the rest of it of course for an organization like one thing we have an extensive discovery process we go through those same questions again with you during discovery not just that then we go on to discuss with you what features are does the project have a does the product have right now in case it's a built product or what are you planning on building right what is it going to be in the and then we just lay that all out in a brainstorming session and then there's an exercise that we came up with called 369 which is essentially what can we can, what can go live in 3 months post design what can go live 6 months post design and what can go live 9 months post design so that gives you a hierarchy of the the all everyone's going to write all of the features that they want they i've had will write down augmented reality and all let them do it let them write all of that shit down let them get out of their head but then you give them a reality check okay 3 months mein kya ho sakta hai it's your development you tell us or if we are developing it we'll tell you this is all that's possible in 3 months so that's so you can do that essentially you can have a broad based understanding of the who what why when 
right? Then you refine it with another exercise for the objectives, the mission, vision, goal, everything, right? Then a brainstorming session, and then a session that allows you to understand what is possible by what time. And then you have it. And then you can further go on to refine the audience as well. You can do a demographic psychographic exercise where they write down everything that they know about the audience and then divide that into primary, secondary, etc. So like I said, a very extensive discovery process and that helps. First, spend like the first two weeks, three weeks, just understanding the stakeholders and the product. And you build that rapport through those conversations. And then you can't really go wrong after that. Yeah? Then it's just your design right. has to do the speaking and has to do the talking. Awesome. You'd be surprised. Like, obviously we work at scale and we work with a lot of SMEs and young founders too. And uh, they have no clue. They're like, I have to make an payment. I'm like, you know, you have to break it down a lot more. When I tell them, you have to at least give me a basic user flow, like in your head. How would a person walk through your app also? Even if it's not refined, give me a, a written document of how you navigate. So at minimum, you should have a problem. What is the problem that you're trying to solve for? Like how might we make deliveries faster and more accessible and define what that, means. what does faster mean? Do you mean one hour? Do you mean 10 minutes? What does accessible mean? Do you mean grocery stores around you? Do you mean that you have a set of SKUs that you're willing to sell? What is it? Like it just... Have that problem statement at the very least and who you're building for. And then it's just a matter of digging deeper. Awesome. Makes sense. I think I'm going towards the last questions, uh, but uh, <laughs> a lot of freelancers and as well as founders of studios like yours will be hearing this or maybe are listening to this right now. And uh, it may be an aspirational thing for a lot of folks to try and crack the kind of clients you do especially globally. I'm again sticking to a topic about wanting to get a little bit more information from you about the clients out there. Do you see a sharp difference in clients as well? What can one do to put up a very impressive first impression rather or make a for impressive first perception of them while talking to a global? My team? answer to most things is just research and that's what I'm going to tell you again. <laughs> so do your homework before you meet them, right? You are not the only person pitching to them. Remember that this is not a one-on-one -on -one conversation. They've probably spoken to three people before you. They're going to speak to three people after you, right? So do your homework, know what they need and the way that they need it and have them make that conversation with you, right? In a sense that it's anytime you go into a pitch, if you're going into it, thinking about it as a pitch, you're just going to be doing a pitch, right? However, if you go into it as a conversation and let's look at the basics of a conversation, right? What do you want to talk about? If there is any problem, what are you trying to discuss? Are you trying to come to a conclusion or solution? What is it? If you go into it thinking about it as a conversation about what the other person needs, you'll come off as a little more confident because if you go in with your customer service voice, as I call it, it's not going to look good because everybody else has used it anyway. Now you have to stand out with the kind of conversations that you make, right? Secondly, if you if you have a wide enough portfolio, if you're lucky enough to have a big enough portfolio across industries like ours, then obviously narrow it down to cater to what the product is supposed to be. If you are building, for example, for what do you call for swivel, we not only took our vehicle tech, automobile tech portfolio, but we also took our dashboard portfolio because they also wanted a dashboard and they obviously right. didn't tell us that this is going to, there's going to be a dashboard involved. But you can extrapolate like if we orders we place correct. If you don't have a wide enough portfolio, you only have four projects. They are the best four projects ever. That's how you have to pitch it. You have to go in going, oh, we love solving this problem. And obviously, if you don't love the work that you're doing, it will show in the pitch, right? Mm -hmm. So anything that you show them, it will have to be the best thing ever. Best designed award winning. That's the kind of attitude. Have, right? awesome. Awesome. So that is something that you need to go in with it. Not overconfidence, right? No pitching. Just go in, understand what they want and just use your designer brain to talk through the problem at hand. Not about right. ye function, hona chahi, ye feature, hona right. chahi. What? why are we doing this? Right. How can I help, we help you build this together? And that's the final thing I'll tell you that anytime you are building something, if you are going to go into it as a client agency thing, you are always going to, it's not going to work out well for you. But if you go into it, think about it as a partnership, which is what it is, right? 
because you have certain skill set that they want and you are willing to provide it right so it's a partnership because if they had that skill you wouldn't be in the room with them so they need you you need them it's a partnership work according to that talk through those lines of thinking and right. you should have a very good pitch on your hands so yeah so awesome. i think very tactical points i love that of course prep for the meeting segment your portfolio so you can show them a good relevancy then you mentioned about enthusiasm passion show that you love your work pitch it as like it's the best and i think yeah i think these three four things make a lot of sense in terms of okay. really impressing a client anywhere out there i also feel from my experience of working with international clients very similar to what you said right they have less patience for you yeah. to screw up so when you say something be there on time don't be late for your meeting they will not like that at all at any cost and if you back the project and you don't live up to your first few commitments in terms of even simple timelines and you don't show proactivity and you're a reactive person to their complaints you're not going to be oh, yeah. able to build a good relationship yeah yeah, yeah. our founder dimanshu likes to use that line a lot he says be proactive not reactive and okay. i think that line has stood the test of time for me like any time i i've obviously with experience you can already see the kind of breakpoints that will happen in a project so you can account for it but you have to actively keep looking for those if you have give if for example you've said this thing will take 6 months but they want it in 4 you know what's going to break right you have to mold your expectations with them accordingly ke jab 4 mahine mein chalo theek hai we'll do this we'll try and do everything but what are your priorities if you state it like that they'll also understand ki okay let's look at priority items first let's look at break points first things like that absolutely being proactive i think is a good way to approach anything awesome super venki i think that marks the end of all my questions which i threw at you Thank you so much for your time. I really hope everybody listening learned a lot about how to really build from India for the world and within the next billion users, which our country is going to make live. Rather, it's happening as we speak. Right. Venki, over to you. Any parting thoughts? Anything you want to talk about? Anything the viewers should check about? One thing in you. Please let us know. Yeah, man. Thank you so much for having me. First and foremost, of course, love this conversation, and I absolutely love your energy, dude. And I'm glad we finally get to do this. I hope. people find this useful of course and i hope that some young entrepreneur out there with the next big idea or the next big design studio is out there listening to this and they can gain some expertise experience out of this fantastic That's venki it. thank you so much one thing's always hiring check their linkedin out for their active jobs they do some very interesting special passion projects on their instagram i recently saw something about ar vr design and i also saw something related to creating xui experiences for electronic mobility like for all the new wave of cars out there so do check those things out we also have a podcast that is out there on spotify and other podcast channels you can go to our website one thing dot design and you will see all of our case studies all of our podcasts the blogs that we've written there's a bunch of knowledge in there please go check that out we do some excellent work Yeah, even though i'm saying so myself but uh, yeah check those check those blogs out check those case studies out go listen to our podcast we have a bunch of people from different walks of life coming and talking all things design and business related to design and all of that so it's good it's fun and uh, like i said i hope we get to do more of these kavan <laughs> fantastic no we'll definitely do more so thanks a lot once again folks for tuning in we'll keep on doing more sessions every month as you'll find it on our social or in your email somewhere and also if you're on the luma community you'll also find it there so thanks a lot everybody bye bye